Let's see if that'll go away. All right, so, um, and I made a typo on purpose. Let's see if you can find it. So look for it. I always found it's fun to uh, put at least one typo in your presentation when you're presenting, because very invariably it allows for the audience to ask at least one question, even if all they're doing is trying to show how dumb you are. It's like, okay, at least I got a question out of my audience. I learned this the hard way at some of the conferences I present at, because there's nothing worse than a dead room where nobody says anything or asks questions. So, all right, so that aside, um, this is part two of a 40 part series. We're staying with the basics. We're painting in broad strokes. We're looking at things at a very high level. We are focused on the intelligence cybersecurity analyst apprentice side of the house. So this is all very basic, very building block information. And today we're gonna to talk about DNS or the domain name system. Now, I'm gonna use a robot theme. So let me introduce you to my DNS robot whose job is just like it is in DNS to help us translate what Monty's saying to something you can understand. Now, DNS does that a lot better than I do, thankfully. And they connect things that you think of when you think of typing a domain or typing a website on the internet, like apple.com or whatever your favorite one might be. And it, DNS's job primarily is to translate that into something it understands, which is a number. And given the two, most people find that they like the one on the right better than they like the one on the left, mainly because remembering, excuse me, remembering a bunch of numbers is kind of tough, especially if I ask you to remember dozens of these. You quickly forget context in a way that is, you know, complete contrast to things like a name. We kind of binded that a lot better. The only thing that make that name better is if I actually put a picture of an apple there, then you'd even more bind to remembering that. So there's a big reason why we did this. And it goes back to how the internet was constructed and all those fights in the beginning between the companies that were involved in how we're we going to structure this. One of the things that came out of it was we're going to create a structured way in which to identify how to access resources across this giant network that we're going to call the internet. And so we're going to talk about that a bit today, a bit today, if I can talk. So let's, let me introduce my aliens. We're going to talk about aliens a little bit. So here's my little flying saucer, and we have Ooh. some fun cows today. And so he's scanning and pulling up that cow. And I bring this up only because, one, I want you to, to understand that this doesn't have to be really heavy, really hard, really difficult and boring. It can actually be funny and fun. Uh, and that helps you mem remember things better and helps you understand the concepts in some cases. So I tried to inject some humor. I'm kind of not a very good at humor guy, but I do my best. So in this case, I want you to remember that these cows represent domain names and domain names are important because they're the human readable thing I was talking about that makes this very complex system that is the domain name system function for you. Because otherwise you would be rapidly lost in how complex it is behind the scenes. Those things you do daily by typing in a name in your browser or clicking on a link behind the scenes, there are dozens, if not hundreds of processes that have to fire off in less than a fraction of a second to get you back an answer. And you have no idea how complex those things are in many cases. The beauty for us as analysts is that opens the door for us to understand a process better than anything else can, because we can find things out about it that differ from the norm or give us insight. But I'm getting ahead of myself. One of the things I want you to remember here is domain names are things like google.com, apple.com, microsoft.com, whatever any of those you can think of or can mention. And that overarching authority lies with an organization called ICANN or the Internet Corporation for Assigned Numbers and or Names and Numbers, excuse me. They don't do everything. Like any good leader, they kind of distribute the work. So they hand this off, i.e. they ask people for money for the ability to actually manage some parts of this process. And the actual registration of names and managing who owns those names and things like that are something owned by corporations. So you have ICANN and underneath it, you have a series of other organizations, both profit and not-for-profit, and then a lot of for-profit entities underneath them that allow you to register a domain name or find a domain name if you want to. And that's going to be something important that we talk about as we go through the series, because your adversary, which is someone who wants to abuse the person you're protecting or the company you're protecting 
or the reason or, or is performing something malicious, they will take advantage of that fact in a lot of ways that you can detect because you will have an understanding, hopefully, of all the behind the scenes processes. Okay, a lot for my little flying saucer. Let me do another one. It's an important thing not only to understand that those names translate to numbers and that they're how we identify resources out there on the internet, but that they are you can decompose them and they have some very important components. One of those is the in, so everything past that period. So the Apple, we're talking about the dot .com portion. That's generally what we consider a top level domain. So you'll hear people say top level domain, TLD or something equivalent. And we're talking about that last part. Now that's very important. And I'm gonna to allude to the back behind the scenes process here for a second. When you go to apple.com, for example, there is a computer that responds to you whose sole job is to be a traffic cop. We're gonna talk about it a little bit later. And its job is to tell you where resources are. Now it has no idea where apple.com is in the world, but it knows who to ask. And so it knows because that's a .com address, it knows to go ask the .com root server, which is the topmost level server it can query. And at that point starts a series of handoffs that will hopefully result in someone in someone being a computer in that process going, I know apple.com, let me get you there. And they provide that IP address or that number that's been assigned to that resource. Now it's a lot to digest. So if you have a question, jump in. When you do this, you don't think about it. You just click a link or type a name in and all this kind of magically happens. But for us, these things are very important. I'm gonna take quiet, there's no questions. If you do, just inject. There are different types. I'm just gonna talk about two of those categories briefly. One is country code TLDs. So just like there is a TLD for .com, there's one for .net. I'm sure you've seen plenty of domains that end in .net. There's another one for .org, .gov, and so on. Those are kind of very high level servers that own that, that start the handoff. And I'll pass around after this or included in the recording afterwards, a nice graphic that really goes into detail on what that handoff procedure looks like. But country code TLDs are just as important as those root level ones. They're kind of the next tier down and they represent a geographic area. So for the United Kingdom, it is, it wouldn't be .com, it would be .co.uk. They have what they call a country code or CCTLD that represents an entity that should exist in the United Kingdom. But the way the internet works, we don't force people to actually be true to what they say they are. You could register in America, register a co.uk address. And as long as you provide the right information, no one's going to question that. So again, it's, it's kind of one of those things where we say it represents something, but there are plenty of ways around the restriction and the exactness behind that so that you can, you can have be an American using a UK country code with no problem. And there are other TLDs that represent very specific things. So there are plenty of these, you might be able to name some, but some of the recent ones that are kind of fun are dot .party, which are political groups, dot app, which kind of are representative of all those apps we have on our phones and other devices that are everywhere these days, organization politics and so on. There's plenty of them. And there, in fact, there's hundreds of TLDs possible. Some of them are well-recognized, .net, .com, .biz, .org, and so on, and we're very familiar with those. There are some that are a lot less recognized, like .lab, .me, .whatever, .academy, right? Those we look at a little more skeptically. One, they're harder to type many times because there's nothing better than .com because it's very short, .io, very short, easy to remember, .academy, .laboratory, .interview, dot so on, those get a lot more difficult, but they're there. And the other part that I'm going to say here that's kind of important is, as I said earlier, part of ICANN's job is to allow you to register these and kind of track that, but they distribute this or they lease this out to other entities. And depending on who they've created a contract with, only some organization can create certain TLDs. Like the .gov TLD is very restricted to only a few organizations that are allowed to create those. But the .laboratory one can be created by just about anybody. But some of the country code ones are represented only by entities that exist in those countries. 
So it can get very specific. And that knowledge, that behind the scenes knowledge is something we as analysts use to our advantage to help understand our adversary and how they resourced a particular item if they attacked us or if we were interested in doing research on them. Again, thinking about the first presentation where I talked about there are defensive, offensive, and research-based analysts in our field. Questions so far? Comments that you'd like to make? No, you answered mine. It was about the, um, you, you said originally that it was kind of uh, maybe arbitrary who could get in and who can't, but there are specific rules from the specific TLDs that are being leased out by the ICANN that each mm -hmm. one has. Okay. That's correct. And there are new TLDs that are created every year. Mm -hmm. There doesn't seem to be an end, sadly. And the way this has turned out is most new TLDs become malicious right off the bat. And by that, I mean the majority of reservations made for names in the new TLDs tend to be malicious or used for bad purposes before they become watered down as more legitimate people kind of use them. Um, .io, when it first came out, was horrible for the first month or two, and then it got much better, thankfully. But dot laboratory and you know even to a certain extent uh, dot news is very bad right now. It's like 50 50 on whether you're going to get something malicious or not going to one of those TLDs. And so it 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 kind of varies a lot. You know, so they're great ideas, but not every you know dot party TLD is actually a political entity. A lot of times they are a phishing or a cyber attack that's structured to aim at someone. Uh, before I leave this slide, one of the things I really want to convey is it becomes very important to learn these details. And you kind of learn them once and you, and you write them down and you understand, because again, as analysts, it's important. This is how we find our adversary when they make mistakes. And if it isn't clear from the first presentation of this one, our adversary looks exactly like the people around you. If you have any around you, you can look at them and give them a kind of suspicious glance because that's what your enemy looks like. They are a person with human frailties, with worries, with desires, and things that they want to do and things that they don't want to do. And because of that, their habits and behaviors will leave traces for us to follow. And I will go over this over and over and over because I'm a big believer in something called Locard's principle, which comes back from my early history working with law enforcement and doing cold case work. Locard's principle, in short, is the concept that a, a, an individual enters a crime scene and they will leave something behind and take something away. It applies not only in the physical world, but it also applies in the digital world. There's a type of analysis I'll go into and we'll talk about repeatedly, which talks about how certain actions will create artifacts because they will either make an artifact or they will leave an artifact behind. It happens. Every action that you can be composed will, will perform this. Whether you can see it or not is the question. And that's where knowing this background information and knowing at a broad strokes and being able to decline deeper into those details that you can find that kind of information. It is something once you adopt and learn that allows you to instantly recognize things and behaviors and patterns in a way that you can't do if you learn this a different way. So I'll pause there. There's lots to talk about on the next 38 presentations. So we'll get into the weeds with it. But for now, just know that domains can be broken down into one part, the top level domain. And it's very important because it's a reference to the type of servers that can create it and also the ones that will handle it. And another part of it is the second level domain. That's everything to the left of that period. In this case, I've got DuckU as a, a fun kind of domain to talk about. So DuckU.com. Um, the second level domain part is everything to the left of that dot. It incomplete can't be bigger than 255 characters. And if you think back to how the internet began, that should make sense because that was a buffer size and a variable limit in the early days that could not be exceeded that we just retained. And there's some fun things about it. It has rules. You can't necessarily start with a number. You can't have spaces in it, right? It has to be completely consecutive. So you can have underscores and periods, things like that, but you can't really um, have dashes and so on that represent very well. And so you can kind of use this in combination. The, the fun slash neat part is you can do a lot of tricks with this because the second level domain, uh, when you register these, depending on who you go through, it doesn't really care what 
how you render it is the best way to explain it. If you've looked at fonts before, you'll realize that different fonts kind of are structured to, to visibly be viewed one way. So in, if looking at two different fonts, one of them, if you took the number one and the letter I, they might look identical visibly, which can be used to your advantage when you're crafting names because you can send something like that that looks like nonsense as a domain name that will be understood by the computer on the other end and let you structure a domain that actually has a number or some other representative character to fool someone into thinking it's legitimate. It's a very common, common thing that happens. And so that second level domain becomes interesting. We want them to be sensible because we're humans and we, we suck at remembering gobbledygook, but we're great at remembering blocks of information that we can approximate an image to. So me throwing a cow or a duck or something like that instantly registers an image in your brain. If that was a bunch of letters, you would not that have no common approximation for you in your head, you're not going to remember it very well, if at all, and your trust in it will be very low. So there's some pot thoughts here that I want you to kind of keep in mind, because you can you can play around with this a lot and create subdomains, which is kind of important. You can structure things. In this case, mine is I want to believe.com. And typically you craft these subdomains to identify a unique area or a unique service that you want to highlight. You know, there, I have more fun and, and actual practical names here in a bit, but uh, this counts towards your 255 character maximum. So everything to the left of that period, 255 characters max. You can kind of use that to your advantage. You can have any number of periods and stuff you want, but each one counts as one. Otherwise it has the same rules. You can't just throw arbitrary numbers in there and things like that. You have to follow the structure. And that gives you a lot of flexibility, though having a, a domain with us, having a subdomain domain combination that's 255 characters long is kind of rough. Can you imagine typing that? It's like, that's a heck of a, of a domain. Nobody's gonna remember that one and two, no one's gonna want to type it. So typically that's not done. They're kept relatively short and they approximate to important things. Let's do a more practical example. Let's change aliens here. So move away from our saucer and actually pull our blue alien out. This is where names have meaning. So here I've got, I've broken it into four parts for you. You have vpn.alien.saucer.com. And you notice I went four, three, two, one from the left down. So again, .com is the what? Domain name, or sorry, it's the, um... <laughs> uh... oh no, I lost it in my notes. <laughs> it's the top level domain. There we go. Top level domain. And that can be any .com, .net, .org, whatever. Saucer is the actual domain name. That's that second level piece. All right, the alien and VPN are the subdomains. And what we have, what we have here is a reference to locations. So saucer.com, that one and two, that tells me the TLD. So I know what server structure it's gonna follow to, re to resolve. So when you click on that link or you type that in your browser, it's gonna go to the name server that you have assigned, which we'll get into in a minute whose job is just to be a traffic cop. And then it's gonna send you to the .com root level server and then start doing a handoff to try to figure out where saucer.com lives because they're not necessarily going to have the answer. And in fact, they won't at the highest levels because that's not their job. Their job is just to start this handoff. It gets worse when you have the subdomain because it has to resolve that separately. So it may have to ask a lot more servers because you have a, a subdomain in action here. With that alien and VPN, each one of those could refer to not only a different number, but a different location on a server for what that approximates to. And this is where things get fun. So what does VPN stand for? It can be anybody. Virtual private network. And what does a virtual private network do? It pretends to be you. <laughs> Close enough, yeah. So we use VPNs kind of to anonymize ourselves on the net, right? Because it allows us to connect to another server who pretends to be us or routes information for us so that we're not visible to some place that we're either going to or, our, or want to anonymize our traffic. That's kind of the idea behind it. For companies, they use it to secure their resources by forcing people to go to a known location to log in and then only in allowing IPs that come from that known pool of IP addresses to access their resources. It's a, it's a good measure. So as a domain name, when I see this domain and subdomain combination, 
the idea here is that you would recognize that that's a VPN connected to that particular VPN service connected to this subdomain combination. So that you would know at a glance, oh, that's how they get to their VPN. You'd probably expect to log into one or get information about the VPN service. That's the whole idea behind having these laid out the way they are and having names have meaning. We hope that you use things. If you put the word mail in there, it's, it's understood that you're making a reference to email. Now, anytime you have intent like that, you can have someone abuse it. That's why I have the two glasses. So when you see the two spilled glasses in the future, we're gonna talk about attacker intent here where they turn this in some ways to deceive or to do subterfuge on a person to try to lure them into giving up their credentials, for example, by creating a fake approximation of this or something similar. Moving on, and you can eject any time. Again, our blue alien here. Um, there are default, default patterns to names. Now I'm gonna talk about my icons on the bottom before I talk about the two bullets. So the maze is my way of saying there's, an, there's a lot of analysis here that can be done. If you look at my YouTube channel, I have a big maze on there on purpose because typically it is like tracing a maze. The other one is the figure, the gesturing figure and the location. That, that's when you see that I'm gonna make discussion points now and later about actions to artifacts framework logic. That is a logical framework to analyze the fact that every action somebody takes leaves behind or creates an artifact. So let's say one of you goes out and registers a domain with Google today. You go to domains.google.com. When you create that domain, regardless of what you name it, it's going to create a second level domain and a TLD approximating to what you just put in there. It won't create anything extra. It may ask you a bunch of questions to prompt you to do more things, but it's only going to do those steps. And that's important because that's a default pattern that allows us to recognize a Google registration. So even without querying, the registration database that contains all the logs for whoever creates a new domain, we can look at it and, and right off the bat know if that's all that's present, it's in its default state. Now, if someone has created more, they created that VPN piece to it, we would know that then someone had come there and had made a change. And that would be an action that would leave a lot of artifacts that we could go look for and then use for our purpose as an analyst and it goes even deeper down the rabbit hole. GoDaddy is another registrar. Under ICANN, they're allowed to register probably three quarters of the TLDs, if not most of the TLDs that are out there. They also take care of about half of the domain registrations on the internet. You can pretty much bet about 50% of them were done through GoDaddy. They were an early adopter that had a lot of free and very, very inexpensive programs. And they bought a lot of uh, domain registration companies to boot, which makes them a big share, shareholder of a lot of domains. If you go there and create a domain, unlike Google, they create not only your second level domain and TLD, but they'll also automatically throw a mail dot, they'll create a mail subdomain, a dub 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 subdomain, and, and two or three other ones as well. Depending on their policy, it's changed a few times. So trivia question, what does dub 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 stand for? World Wide Web. World Wide Web. So why does that exist? Anybody want to tackle that one? It's one of the earlier days um, kind of remnants, isn't it? It is indeed. So back when they started putting this together, they needed a way to distinguish between a local resource and a resource that was remote. And one of the ways they started doing that was this adoption of a World Wide Web label. And so they said, well, if you have something that's not local, let's put World Wide Web in front of it so people know that they're going to a remote resource. However, as times will, as time has went on, um, we've adopted it and we just think that's part of the internet these days. They're like, oh, it should have a www, but it doesn't have to. It's a subdomain. That's why you'll see like www2 dot something like that. It can be anything that's valid as a subdomain but is a well-known, respected, kind of comfortable thing that we have an expectation to be in place. So key takeaway here, there are default patterns that once you learn them, 
you go look at them. So if I see a new domain creation for GoDaddy right now, and I look at it, and the mail and www piece has been removed, I know that they have manually done that. It is not something that happened out of the default creation process. And so I will know at that point, at a minimum, that initial registration happened to register that domain, and then someone had to manually access it or automate it through script or whatever, and make a change and remove those. And again, I want, I care about that because it creates records that I can follow. I can get artifacts that give me a timestamp. Um, as a trivia item, how long do you think it takes a domain to become active with a website for the regular user? How long does it take them to get a website going for a domain that they buy? Uh, maybe within the week for a regular person? So within a week for a regular person? Anybody else? As soon as the IP address is assigned? As soon as there's an IP address assigned, okay. So the average person, yeah, so all of you are fairly close. Mike, did you have a answer? I was just gonna say, it, it kind of depends on your service, but it can be almost instantaneous, not necessarily quite there, but you can do it very quickly if you have one of the services that register and build the website simultaneously. That's correct. And so it would look a certain way, right? If it was done simultaneously, would you agree? Mm -hmm. You would see a velocity of creation for the, for the domain, the records, and then the website. And it would have a lot of defaults that are part of those templates if you followed that path. So it'd be very distinctive. But a person who's bought a domain and then is going to create a website on it will take weeks, sometimes even a month or two before they'll actually have a constructed website that they make public. The common time frame is 34 days right now, based on the statistics I looked at for 2021, from when a person registers the domain to when they actually have content that you would travel to. But for a cyber attacker, they can turn that around within minutes and have a phony fake site on there. Sometimes shorter, but generally speaking, as a rule of thumb in the security business, any domain that's 24 hours or, or younger is malicious because majority of people who have legitimate uses for a domain or a website don't turn around that fast. It becomes a very common flag. That goes back to me talking about know your default patterns, realize what actions will craft what artifacts and, and learn to analyze those so that you can rapidly profile and pick up where you can go to find out information. And why would I care? Let me, let me cast that in a larger construct for you. If I was an attacker creating a operational campaign against a target, and I wanted to craft a hundred or a couple hundred um, sites that I'm gonna use as my, my campaign, I may not do them all at once, but I'll definitely do them in batches. I won't do them in onesies. So I'll probably find a service that supports batching preferably that I can pay through you know, a cryptocurrency or something that anonymizes my monetary trace. And I'm also gonna to try to do it by API or remote so that I create less records. And I'm gonna batch that in groups of 10 or 20 or something that it meets my comfort level. And if I'm connected to a botnet, some of that creation will be automatic based on what my the DGA, which is your dynamically generated algorithm for the main creation will be. And then you can kind of start doing fun things when that, when you, once you understand those things, because it gets you behind the scenes on things. So if there's a, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. If there's a dynamically generated algorithm to craft what the next domain is going to be, and you can crack that as a defender, you can get ahead of it and actually reserve those ahead of the attackers. Their software is hard to turn around. So that means you can head it off, stop it, and so on. There's several attacks in the last couple of years that have been completely disrupted from that one kind of activity. The other part though, is just understanding how they resource to operate becomes very important. So attribution is a part of our career field that is both ugly and muddy and heavily political in nature. Nobody agrees because the objectives behind attribution are, are very murky. Now that's a really, decorated way to say people have a political agenda when they attribute always, including us when we do it, we'll have something in mind. But generally speaking, attribution 
at a level where you can identify a country is poor. It's a bad thing to do in the sense that it doesn't give you any analytical value other than it will steer resources, which can be the intent behind it. But when you're trying to do attribution to understand how well a group is organized, resourced, how they weaponize, how they monetize, all these eyes kind of things I'm throwing out, that's where it becomes very, very useful. So knowing how, for example, they would construct a DNS-based campaign to either fish or to do a cyber strike on a target is important because it'll tell you their, about their processes and also tell you how much money they have and where they get their money from, which can be very, very important. So a well-resourced cyber attacker may have a large volume of money or they may have a lot of money that's tied up. Like ransomware entities have a lot of tied money. They have money, but you know they have money, but they don't have a lot of what we would think of as ready cash in which they could take advantage of. It becomes a much more different and difficult process for them to leverage that. Versus another one that perhaps bootstrap their way, works on a cash only model and keeps everything in a very solvent state. They're going to operate differently and they're gonna use their tools differently. That's the tradecraft behind becoming a good analyst in performing attribution is knowing all those defaults, knowing when people stray from them and being able to make identifications. But I'm getting way off topic to my introduction here. I'm off broad strokes down into the smaller detail. Let me back back up and go back to just know in DNS, there are defaults, there are default patterns to how you name and build things. And there are automatic defaults from when you go and register those domains that can be very, very useful to identify and understand. Mouse going back again. And it's important to know that those names match a place. Every subdomain and domain is registered to a location. Well, you've heard us say IP address a couple of times. That is a number that approximates to a computer or a location on a computer so that it represents that resource that's attached to the internet. And there's, it's really, it's more complex than I'm going to touch on today as far as how that's structured. But generally, when you see an IP address, that represents a computer or a location on a computer that you would use to find it on the internet, the World Wide Web, or however you like to refer to it. Even if you've just registered your domain, and you're like, I haven't done anything with it, it will still have that IP address, that address to identify it. Generally, we call that parking of domain and a, you have a parked place server or a parked server and you have that situation. I'll try to explain that a little bit better. So let's talk about server mapping just a hair here. So here I want to believe, I want you to believe ancient aliens.religion is my domain and subdomain combination. If you look, the ancient aliens.religion, if you go down to my alien head there on the right, you'll see that that location on a server would be home and I've used UX Linux Cyber. That's completely random. It can be named anything and the naming will match how the hosting provider who gives you the space on that server, what the rules are. And you'll notice that when under the believe that alien head goes to a different directory location. And the same thing for the I want you to goes to even another location. And that's in, that can be very important as we go on. As you can see, I've got the maze down there. This is an area where analysis of matching how a domain is structured to what it's likely server structure actually on that computer would look like can be very advantageous. We will go into that in a whole presentation. So I'll leave it there, though I will take questions if you end up having them. Otherwise I will continue and you can save them as we go. So I mentioned- I love the alien theme. Oh, thank you. We have more aliens to go. Uh, Fantastic. I, like I said, it should be lighthearted. There's, there's lots of very somber pieces to what we do, but it doesn't have to be that way. So uh, I'm using this abacus to kind of uh, help you visualize what a park place would be. So when, if you were looking at just an IP address and you were trying to figure out, and this is a very common task for us, by the way, you get an IP address and someone will go, what's on that IP address? And you go look and you're like, there's 50,000 domain names sitting here. You know that you've probably stumbled across a park place server. Its sole job is to be a parking lot. And very normal. 
every registration authority has one or more servers whose sole job is to do this. And that can be very useful to know because it can help you understand things. For example, I give a good behavioral example. Example, excuse me. A let's have a domain name. Our our previous one, ancientalien.religion, it's parked. And then one day it becomes unparked and goes to a different IP address for 24 hours and then it returns to being parked. That's a pattern of behavior that indicates that it went operational for 24 hours and then returned to a parked status. If it continued to do that on an interval, that's something you could measure and then understand. And you could go see what they were doing and you could predict potentially when the next time they would do that. Now, most attackers are decently savvy and they tend not to fall into these kind of habits. But as I mentioned in the beginning, they look a lot like the people around you. So they have bad habits and they mess up and they get lazy and their dog goes off or runs away and they have to, and they get, they get intercepted in the middle of what they were doing and things that should have gotten cleaned up don't, or they make mistakes. It just kind of goes on. Those are things that we capitalize on regularly. So back to IP addresses just briefly. I contemplated moving this up earlier, but I've left it here. Um, as I mentioned, they are a unique address. They identify a device on the internet or a local, right? That IP part stands for internet protocol, which helps make sense, right? We are talking about the internet. And I, the biggest thing I want you to remember is it lets information travel between two devices. It's difficult to find you without an IP address. And you probably won't be surprised, but when they created the internet, they thought, well, if we had a couple of million of these, we should have enough. And they were, they as organizations across the world were really surprised when we rapidly ran out, mainly as businesses kind of got onto the internet existed. And they're like, wow, you can make money this way. Next thing you know, we ran out of IP addresses. So we've figured out all kinds of different ways to try to make IP addresses stretch. So if you've ever had to like, okay, we're going to be eating pancakes for the last week or two of your month because you ran out of money, it's exactly what happened here with IP addresses. That's why there's only so many. And when you run out, you're kind of out. That's why we've come up with all these little tricks. And we have local ways to have different IP addresses that really all map to a single IP address that represents, you know, whatever's behind that IP on the internet. That was very complicated. This is best shown with pictures, which I will do in a future presentation. But just know that we're going to talk about a bunch of tricks here that we've done with IPs. And yes, there are different versions. I'm making a reference to IPv4 version 4, which is what most people are, are familiar with. There is another version, IPv6, that is a lot more esoteric and hard, even harder to follow as far as numbering goes that has a lot more capability, but it has not been fully adopted even though it's been a decade plus. So kudo points for whoever can tell me what 127001 stands for. Well, is that your local? Well, that's, you did it as a question. <laughs> it's in the chat. <laughs> oh. Loopback local. I mean, it is loopback local. There you go. I'm like, this isn't Jeopardy. <laughs> so let's not do it as a question. <laughs> yes, that is uh, what we call, there's no place like 127001. So just like Dorothy, we all want to go home. That's home. That's your local loopback. That's you. So if you ever, ever are in a meeting with a bunch of executives and one of them comes in and gasps and says, oh my God, we're being attacked by 127001, Try not to fall out of your chair. I, I didn't succeed. I fell out of my chair. I couldn't, st I couldn't stop it. <laughs> and I did not stay there after that because it was horrible. That, that kind of gross misunderstanding of the internet is, our job to, is part of our job to fix. Because <laughs> education is a hallmark of what we're supposed to do. If you remember the, um, the B2 I drew last presentation, the tip of that sucker was education for a reason. Those kind of things happen. Unfortunately, it's our job to help clear those up. But that is, that is set to home for a reason. It is a default. Just like there are default names, there are defaults for IP addresses. There are some ranges that represent um, IPs that do not get used. There are some ranges that represent um, residential or personal use IPs. 
And so companies are not supposed to use them. And so there are some divisions in there that you can leverage to your advantage as an analyst. Again, more to come. Broad strokes right now, just broad strokes. Just know they're out there and that an IP address represents a machine or a device on the internet. All right, going back to this, just briefly, go back to the alien heads. You'll see here that um, I've added IP addresses to those locations because just because you have a subdomain doesn't mean that they necessarily have the same IP address. So in this case, ancientaliens.religion is that 64118. Believed on ancient aliens, that religion also goes to 64118, but the subdomain I want you to believe ancient aliens, not religion, goes to a completely different IP address and resource. And that's on purpose. People, you can have many, many variations of this. And this can tell you things. All right. This fella here is those domain name registrars I was talking about. And these are the companies underneath ICANN that have been leased the authority or given the authority to make domain name reservations. It, they are absolutely critical to how DNS works. And, you know, like as, as I alluded to earlier, I kind of took my steam for this particular um, slide in the sense that I've already said that different ones can do different things. They're allowed to register in some ways that some aren't. Google's probably the most widespread, followed by GoDaddy and a few other ones. But the core concept here is you can propose a domain name reservation to any registrar and they'll tell you whether it's available or not. So in this case, at their basic, they do things I have here on the right. Green means something was available, red means something was taken. And there's a whole system there with its rules and you can analyze that to get information. There's a whole sector of our profession who looks at new domain registrations and domains that have aged out because you don't get it for life. You have to pay. Very rarely do you get anything for free that's worth it. And definitely in DNS, you don't. So if you reserve a name, there's a cost associated with it. And it, that changes, how much you pay changes how long you get to reserve a domain for. So, and there's a lot of things there that I want to go into, but I'm going to save for a future presentation or we'll be here forever. Uh, there's so much analysis you can do here that gives away attackers because the very basic things that they don't pay attention to are tells to us where they're registering from and how they're actually provisioning the money for that. And I will give an example, just a short one. When you use an API to reserve a domain name, and you do it in a batch, even the services that allow you to pay with cryptocurrency or pay in a way that obscures your money trail, they leave tool marks behind of their process. So one is the speed in which all 10 or 20 or whatever you did get reserved. The other part is what domains you teal these, especially you chose when you did your reservation and also the process you went through to do the checks. Remember I said every action can leave an artifact, either create one or leave one behind. The very checking process to see if a name is available leaves a record, it actually leaves a series of records. The only question is whether you can see them or not. So I can, well, literally I can, but I can, the organization, like every good organization, sells all the data they collect. So you can actually buy that information from them it's usually time delayed by 24 or 48 hours, up to 72, depending on how much you want to pay. But you can actually gather that information and see the patterns there. You can see when people do entire blocks at once and map them back to a resource. And once I know how you've purchased something, I can follow the money trail. It's not a joke just on TV, but if you follow the money, in most cases, you will find the, the heart of what's going on. Absolutely. And it, it continues through the cyber industry. Now, obviously that's not inexpensive, nor is it easy because there's a large amount of data. Luckily it's text in nature. That's just one thing that you can do with domain name registration as an example. Now, good news is there's only a couple more slides and we'll get the questions and answers. Okay, so let me talk, introduce another robot here. Another key part of DNS that I wanna talk about today is the name server. And like it sounds, it, it contains a collection of domain names that are matched IP addresses. 
in the very beginning, I said there was this chain of handoffs. A typical domain name, a .com one, will go through about 25 to 50 handoffs before you actually get an answer. And it'll do it in a fraction of a second. That's how fast they are because each name server does one thing. It does a quick look up and says, I have a telephone book, do I have this number? And if the answer is no, it moves on, it hands it off. The key that they have is when they receive an input, they know two very critical things. I either know what this is or I don't. And if I don't know what it is, I know who to give it to. Who do I talk to next? And that continues on. And that will go from the very top level root servers as they call them, all the way down through country level, getting into regional specific, and on down, all the way down to the person that manages the internet for you and manages the internet for the resource you're trying to access until it can come back with what they consider authoritative answer. That's why it's, I know that, I don't know that. And it's very, very simple. And as you can imagine, every action leaves artifacts. And so your name servers keep this rolling list of every query you make to them. The simplest way to get an answer from them that anybody in the world can do is there's a command on any operating system out there, except Windows, you have to download it for Windows, but it's called dig, D-I-G. And you can dig for information. You can dig a name server and say, hey, do you know this domain name? And it'll tell you the, basically the last time it saw it. And it'll do that by telling you a number. And so, because it doesn't want to repeat itself. So if you ask it a question, you're like, where is ancient alien dot religion? And it answers that question, even if it's a handoff, it will log that information to that rolling list and keep it cached, which means it'll keep it on hand until it gets enough other queries and it pushes it off and then it'll repeat it, which means you can get a number from it that approximates how long it's been in its cache. So your dig response, you're like, dig, ancient aliens dot religion. If you get something like a 20, that means it just saw it recently and it's in the top part of its queue. As it starts getting a bigger number, it's getting farther down its queue and before it drops off completely. And then if you query it again, it'll record that number. Now there's a way to query it so that you don't leave a record. So you don't actually make an entry that you then look at and go like, I just saw it. No, you just did that, right? There's lots of ways to do that. And it goes on. You can query a name server to know if it, see if it knows something in a way that, like I said, does it without leaving a record. And it can be very useful, as you can imagine, from our perspective as analysts. And you can do it from different locations. I can query from Texas, where I live, or I could query as if I lived in a different country and get different perspectives from across the internet. So name servers are your best friends as analysts. You can really dig into a lot of data there to piece together how something may have happened, especially in relation to attack or an operation. It's best done in the time that that activity is occurring, but it can be done after the fact, but not too long. As I mentioned, it's a rolling list, so it will drop off after a certain point, and then you won't know. Now, that, that's kind of semi-complex. Questions on that? Are you going to have a separate um, piece for... Okay. Yeah, I have a whole talk on name servers. It might take two, depending on how I how it moves forward. Yeah. Because name servers are something, if you have the time to spend, you can really learn a lot of information from them. Uh, so let's talk about them in one other context I didn't put on the slide. Every domain that gets registered has to have a name server assigned to it. In fact, it has to have two, because that's how the internet is structured. You must have two, even if you, you have to have two entries. They can be identical entries, but they have to have two entries. You can have maximum 10. So by default, when you create a, a registered domain with a domain registrar, it's going to create a bunch of records, one of which is going to be name servers. If you don't specify a name server, it will assign defaults to you. So as an analyst, when I go to a new domain reservation and I see it has custom name servers, I know immediately that they that that person or someone has moved away from the default and added some customization to it and that becomes important because if they did that there's a path to do that they either came in by api or they went there manually there's not a lot of other options they can talk somebody else into doing those two actions but they have to approach it that way as well now i'm making an allusion to a a 
kind of an old school process called course of action analysis. It's a very kinetic way of planning where you look at all the approaches or paths that can be taken to get to an objective. And it applies very well to cyber. COA or course of action analysis is a very good thing to combine with other frameworks to figure out what the most likely path a cyber attacker took to attack you or to take an action and the most likely ways that you can detect them by figuring out the, the choke points or the smallest areas where there's the least amount of variance. Name servers play into that heavily because everybody uses a domain server on the internet, excuse me, a name server. The only time you don't have a name server involved is if you have a decentralized platform, which stands out like a sore thumb in network traffic. So there's fun things you can do here. These are all later presentations. I'm just kind of giving hints right now. Uh, again, broad strokes as much as possible, and then we'll start really digging into detail. Let's do one more slide here. This is my poor robot that's in pieces. Because this is another part of DNS. A key part of DNS is not just all those things I talked about, but the digest of records that gets created. These are defaults that are present for pretty much anything that gets created. You may or may not have a C name record, but you will have almost all these other ones. And they all represent data about those domains that got registered. So a, a record, and even the triple, you see there's a quad A there. So A record is the IP version four number. So I said, every name has to have an IP address. That's where that IP goes. If you have a record that has four A's, the ah number, we'll do a little Monty Python here then that number is an IPv6 number and you will recognize it immediately because it is long and ugly. And again, every domain has to have a name server. So you will see the name server will record at least two and up to 10 name servers. And that's for, it's meant to be for redundancy. The idea is that there's one name server that's the lead and everyone else is the backup. And the idea is if the lead can't respond, the backup kicks in. So if you're a business and you wanna make sure that you're on all the time and you have no problems, no loss of data, you, all your customers always have access, you will define 10 name servers in geographic part, different parts of the world so that in case one region of the internet goes down, you still allow customers to get to your website. That's kind of the concept there. MX stands for mail record. That's where you would assign a number or a DNS name for your email server. The uh, C name is when you're going to take a subdomain or your domain itself and point it at another domain. You're kind of redirecting or forwarding a response to another location. Pointer record does something similar. Uh, it can be identical to some of the other information, but it will contain data about your domain and where, where it's pointing to. That's why it's called a pointer record. A lot of times it duplicates some of your other data here. Your TXT record is basically a text buffer that can hold a lot of different things. It's meant to be very flexible. SOA is your statement of authority record. Again, uh, it can be identical to some of the other ones. Its job is to tell you where the beginning of a beginning and end of like a zone file is, which is a separate topic we'll get into. And SRV kind of records data about your server that can be very, very useful. And these can all be analyzed and should be analyzed when you're really digging into something and you're trying to break up the details of an operation. This is where people make the most mistakes as your adversary and where the analyst can capitalize on a lot of very good information. It's also underserved in our industry because it is glossed over and considered less important in many cases, but it can be very useful. The problem is it takes time to analyze. That's our biggest killer. So I'm gonna stop. This is a lot of information about DNS. And hopefully it was comprehensive enough for you to kind of gather something useful from it. So I'm, are there any questions? I'll start with that. I had a question about um, when you were talking about IP addresses um, okay. and Go back you were time. approached with um, that somebody had said that the local feedback loop was attacking. Yes. What did that look like? What um what was the what made him afraid of that? <sighs> well, it I, I do not want to say names because the guy was not adroit at what we do, but he was in a position of authority, sadly, which is a very common thing that happens in corporations. 
when he read the reporting that it was given to him, he misunderstood the implications of the data he was provided. It's a very common trick for uh, an attacker to stop resolution of an IP address by adding an entry to a file on Windows called host so that it goes to loopback or 127001, which means if you try to go to it, you're just gonna to go to nothing. Now you're just gonna stay in your local network. And if you're not careful and you look at that, you're like, wow, there's so many things that were, so many bad things were looping back to this one IP address. That must be the IP address that was attacking us. That's kind of where his brain went to. Now, to his credit, he's really good at people. He's really terrible at cybersecurity. Fair enough. So um, he, it was just, uh, it looked like there was a lot of, of business going on with this IP address um, as the, as the IP address of, I'm just trying to figure out like what would be um, worrisome. Sorry, I'm not sure what my question really is. Yeah, but, I'm, uh, I'm trying, I'm struggling a little bit to answer this for you well. So there's a lot of things you can do with loopback. Like I can take a process, that's a process that's running on Windows specifically and other places too, but uh, depending on your operating system, but basically home. You can point a lot of things at home. Like if I start a service locally and I want to create a web server or something, I can uh, bind it to home and give it a port number, which is a way to, to kind of, Remember I said they did all kinds of tricks to, um, to play with IP numbers and also make connections. We didn't touch on ports yet, but just like there, you think of a big ship that's got a bunch of ports that you can open up and look out the window and you can pass things back and forth or whatever makes sense to you there. There's 65,535 of them. So I could have 127001 colon one all the way up to 65,535. I have a lot of options. Mm. The first 10,000, first 1,024, excuse me, are kind of allocated with specific resources that are expected to be present. But outside of that, it kind of gets kind of wild, wild west. And so I could say start a web server locally on 127.0.0.1.50,000. And then I could run something malicious from it, or I could have it start other processes or do a million things with it. It's kind of wide open. But you should never look at that and go, that's attacking us. Because that one, that's you. It's an internal IP address that represents your computer. So right. no, it's not going to suddenly attack you from the outside because that does not make any sense. Thankfully, it's only happened once in my career. On a, a broader scale, right? How much of the responsibility of conveying that information is placed onto us as analysts and and well, I guess it would depend on your our audience, but like it does. It depends heavily on your audience. Um, you as as folks as press professionals in our field, our education piece is one of our tip of the spear kind of elements. We're always advising or providing guidance and educating both up, down, and laterally, because no one is assumed to know everything. And frequently, the folks that we work for we're in a strategic position with us, they do not have the technical know-how. It's our job to make sure we provide that for them and convey it in a way that they can understand. Generally, we think we have to dumb it down and that would be correct because they neither have the time or inclination to learn the technical <laughs> details that we know, just like right. we can't do the same for the strategic decisions they're making in most cases. They're juggling different data. So, but it is still very incredibly frustrating, but how well you do that can determine how well your program functions as well, you know, as part of it. So conveying in, in like information about an attack, there are some key things. If there's an intrusion, there's an incident that's happened in the place I work, conveying the fact whether we need to take immediate action or we can delay action for 24 hours is kind of critical. And sometimes that's determined by how you start that first part of the conversation. If you walk in and throw something on their desk and say, we're completely owned, you might not get a great response that's going to lead to a good discussion because then you're going to get a series of questions or, you know, kind of nobody wants to hear that. So they're going to push back. Now, obviously, if all their computers go dark and there's a ransomware kind of screen, it's pretty obvious what happened. Right. And then you're going to go through the whole human nature cycle of what's going on. But skipping all that, educating is important. Typically, we don't have that situation where it's an emergency or everything is broken. 
generally it's like, hey, we're getting heavy fishing. It's related to the fact that you're, we have a lot of people going to conferences and when they come back, their laptops tend to have things that they shouldn't have on them or they're adding beacons into our network that's giving away internal information about us that's leading to sales of data in places that cyber criminals hang out. And that means we have excess phishing. You know, it's up 120% from last month. You can kind of convey that and educate people why it's happening. Because the answer isn't don't go to conferences. That's a bad answer. The answer is there might need to be a process when people rejoin the network that makes sure that they're safe. Right. Right. That's the education part that needs to get done better and well in our, in our industry. That's really critical. Okay. A good question. Silence is good. I like silence. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions, then I will close this up, stop the recording. Do that right now.